started the a Black Education Institute, uh, a Black Education Network Summer Institute. We have to start this off right. All right. So welcome, welcome, welcome to a Black Education Network's Summer Institute. Give yourselves a hand for coming up in the summer. Let's give all the deck a hand for giving us a hand off right. A few years back, in a small Midwest city, a young black man was excited for his first day as a volunteer reading tutor. He had been trained by Project Read on how to tutor young elementary students, and he was excited and ready to change the world. Does that sound familiar mm -hmm. at all? Yeah. Woke up early, got presentable, went and signed in at the front office of the school, got his name badge, he was assigned to a, a third grade class. Everybody's concerned about the third grade reading test. So they wanted to make sure that the third graders were prepared for that test. What's important to know is also that the third grade is how they tell how many prisons they're going to build in the future. So this young black man was excited. He's ready to change the world. He goes into the class. It's like a Jay-Z album, all black, everything. <laughs> black school, black neighborhood, black teacher, black man, black children, all black, everything. 99.9% .9 all Jay-Z album. The, the lesson for the day as he walked into the classroom was genealogy. What is an aunt? What is an uncle? What is a cousin? What is a brother? What is a sister? What is a mother? What is a father? Pretty good lesson to walk into, right? All black everything. But when the volunteer looked at the handout that the children were, were reading from, what did he see? <coughs> All white faces. So the aunt, the uncle, the cousin, the mother, the brother, the sister were white. But the children were the opposite. So on a scale of 1 to 10, what do you think the interest level of the child was to the curriculum that was being provided for the day? On a scale of 1 to 10, would you say a 5? <laughs> would you say a 4? A 3? It was very low. Of course, that young black man was me. That was just a few years back. And a few years later, what I decided to do with Racial Justice Now and the West Dayton, Youth, West Dayton Youth Task Force because I had uh, flashbacks from my own childhood and the trauma of boredom, right? So what happens when that child is bored? He finds something to do. So when that child balls up that piece of paper with all those white faces and throws it over his shoulder and he winks at the pretty girl next to her, Right? When he throws that piece of paper across the room, he gets in trouble for disruptive behavior because we have zero tolerance in our school system. Okay. We will not tolerate disinterest in our classroom exercises. So that one is sent to the principal's office, detention office, and is not interested in school for the rest of their elementary, junior high, high school career. So we started that campaign to promote culturally relevant curriculum and culturally responsive schools. The first thing we did was to begin to study, to find definitions, to find information and in scholars and research and, and what exactly is culturally relevant curriculum. So we attended conferences. We went out and, and sought out books and scholar and, and wisdom and talked to some elders like Mama Deborah, right? And then we put one demand to our school system. We said we have one demand and one demand only. We wanted two books implemented into the school curriculum. Mandatory reading for all students because our school system is over 70% black. However, it's very racially divided. So where all our schools are, they say 70% black in total, but our high schools, if you go in there, it's 99% black. If you go to the other side of the bridge, it's a different demographic. But we told the school system that we wanted 
all children and high school students to read Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery and The Miseducation of the Negro by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And so we stayed on that for the whole year. The second year we came back and we took all the things that we learned and we put it in one place on our website, which we're going to get to in a little bit, our culturally relevant curriculum toolkit. So we put everything in, in one place so everybody could find it. And then our third year we're coming up, we'll be expanding our toolkit and talking about education for liberation. So what we're going to do in these next 30 minutes that I have, we're going to have a, a Sankofa moment. Who knows what Sankofa means? They all know now. Who knows what Sankofa means? Okay, so, so we're having a little review. So again, who knows what Sankofa means? I didn't see too many hands, Mama, that we, I don't think everybody was listening. I don't think everybody was taking notes. It's from our ancient African traditions. It means to go back and fetch it. So we're talking about going back into our history, back into our time, from things that were taken from us. We didn't lose it. We didn't drop it. We didn't misplace it. It was stolen. It was robbed. Huh? There was it's a felony committed, a crime committed. So we have to take it upon ourselves to be the judge and the jury and go back and fetch it. Culturally relevant curriculum and culturally responsive schools. Many of us know, and maybe of us, many of us don't know, that Africans, particularly North Africans called Moors in that land called Morocco, conquered Spain in 711 and caused the European Renaissance as well as the Judaic Golden Age. Dark-skinned people ruled Europe. Say what, Say what now? <laughs> Let me say it again. Dark-skinned people ruled Europe. Not only did they rule Europe, they had to teach and educate and guide Caucasians that were um, had chickens living in their houses, that had cows living in their houses that didn't know necessarily how to bathe and how to do civilized activities. So the Moors guided to them to that. Al Alazar University, in what they call Egypt, maybe Tony Browder will educate us to another name of that, but is the oldest degree granting university founded in 970. Timbuktu, Mali, in the 1500s was a learning capital. Mali, how many of us know where Mali is on the African map? It's in a, a West Africa? That's not enough hands, is it, right? Timbuktu, people came from all over the world, from the Middle East, from Europe, from various nations across the world to come to study at the feet of Africa. So how do we get where we are today with uh, Betsy DeVos as our representative on how students should learn? How did we get here today? So we're going we're gonna to talk about culture and the significance of culture inside our education. Because I'm here today because I'm the best scholar, because I have a, a great book to release. I'm here because I had my culture stolen from me. I'm here because I was miseducated as Dr. Carter G. Woodson. If you don't know that name, you should write it down. Dr. Carter G. Woodson would say, I was miseducated. I have a, a, a degree from Arizona State University. <laughs> and when I graduated, I knew nothing about myself. Mm. Hello, somebody. How do we get where we are today? Well, look at this uh, young man here, Lord Macaulay's, from the British Parliament, 2nd of February, 1835. How many years ago? We got some math teachers here. How many years ago? 1835. We don't have any math teachers. <laughs> the British Parliament, that, what does that mean? That means government. That means the highest level of rulership. He said, quote, I have traveled across the length and breadth of India. Don't be fooled by India. That means dark-skinned people. I have traveled across the length and breadth of India. I have not seen one person who is a beggar, who is a thief such, who is a thief, such wealth I have seen in this country, such high moral values, people of such caliber, that I do not think we would ever conquer this country unless, mm -hmm. unless we break the very backbone of this nation, which is her spiritual and cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. 
And therefore, I propose that, not I, but we, replace her old and ancient education system, her culture, for if the Indians think that all that is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they will lose their self-esteem, their native culture, and they will become what we want them to be, a truly dominated na nation. I like that word dominant, although the way that he used it, because if you know anything about genealogy or biology, that black is dominant. Yes. Henry Berry, we're moving up the timeline. Have I found any math teachers yet? Uh, 1832, Henry Berry, a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. What's that mean? Virginia House of Delegates mean? Government. Quote, pass as severe laws as you will to keep these unfortunate creatures in ignorance. Who's he talking about? Who are these unfortunate creatures? Your children. The children that you teach every day. Your grandparents, the ones that you descend from. It is vain unless you can extinguish that spark of intellect which God hath given them. Sir, we have as far as possible closed every avenue by which light may enter their minds. We only have to go one step further to extinguish their capacity to see the light and our work will be completed. And they would then be reduced to the levels of beasts of the field, and we should be safe. Jesus. Sir, a death struggle must come between the two classes or races in which one or the other will be extinguished forever. Now, where did that come from? That came from the government. Let's go further. Moving down the timeline. 1902, President Woodrow Wilson. Have you ever heard of this man? Yes. We're here at the uh, world-acclaimed Stanford University. But he was at the world-acclaimed Princeton University as the president. So not only, as you'll see, was he a racist, he was also a classist. He said, we want one class of persons to have a liberal education, and we want another class of persons, a very much larger class of necessity in every society, to forego the privilege of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific, difficult, manual tasks. So when they say they send your child or the child in your class to jail, and they now have become a slave based on the Constitution, and they are working for free for a Fortune 500 company, they are there to perform a difficult, necessary, manual task. That's the president of the United States and the president of Princeton University. So let's think about the conditions of an average slave. That's a terrible word. I shouldn't say that because my grandfather was not a slave. He was an enslaved original man, an original woman. He had his rights taken from him. He, wasn't, he was a, a farmer, an educator, a a minister, a priest, a scientist, your family members, they were not identified or would self-identify as slaves. So let's use the word enslaved. They were not allowed to read or write, work from sunup to sundown, poor quality of food and medical care, marriages had to be approved by slave owners, families broken up, regular beatings. What happens for generation after generation after generation after generation after generation that you don't allow a person to read, that you don't allow them to understand words, that you don't allow them to understand communication. For generation, maybe 10 generations, what happens? What happens to that offspring? Brown versus Board of Education, moving down the timeline, 1954. Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. How many are familiar with this? Okay. A landmark United States Supreme Court case in which the court declared state laws establishing separate public schools for black and white students to be unconstitutional. To win this case, a, uh, a wise person, I think you may have heard of him, uh, maybe Mr. Thurgood Marshall, he said, we want to use a little psychology in the court case. 
let's put a black child, a black baby doll in front of a black child and a white baby doll and we'll ask them continually over and over which one is more beautiful and which one is more intelligent and which one is better and which one would you like to be and which one do you think that they picked after 400 years? I think we know the answer to that. Moving down the timeline, our son uh, was a fourth grader in Dayton Public Schools and uh, when we started our, started our first year campaign to promote culturally relevant curriculum and culturally responsive schools, one thing that we did was a curriculum review. Let's look at the books, see what's going on in the books. Let's see what they're learning. Let's see what they're visualizing. Let's see what they're hearing. Let's see what their tactile functions are being engaged in. People who make a difference. Let me, let me do the Vanna White. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you are familiar with Dr. Malefi Asante uh, from Temple University? Uh, he's the theoretician of Afrocentricity. He's the chairman, and uh, Afrocentricity is an international organization um, at this point. And so you should become more familiar with Dr. Malefi Asante and the centric idea. How? Just, I'm sorry, just a minute. So uh, Dr. Brian Brown is here. I'm sorry. I'm not taking time from you. Okay. I'm going to pause my clock. Yes, yeah, pause your clock. So Dr. Brown is going to get you on Wi-Fi, but also uh, I want to introduce him. He is the assistant, or wait, is it the assistant dean or the associate dean? Associate dean. He's the associate dean of Stanford's Graduate School of Education here. And so, yeah, that's He was the one who was going to reach earlier, um, but our wires got a little crossed, and 
his students are in my STEM program, um, you know, I told you about. Um, his children, I'm sorry, his children are in my STEM program. So they're actually at the Stanford Linear Accelerator today um, for the first day of their week-long camp. So can you imagine a camp for all black students in STEM? Right, that's pretty amazing. Uh, at, at Slack, <laughs> at Slack. So he was there getting his kids situated, and I said, yeah, come over, I just introduce you. So he's here, but I'm glad he's here because I want him to just take a moment and welcome you um, to our Graduate School of Education. He's an amazing, amazing professor and dean and father, and I just loved him. Yep. When you think about James Meredith and what he had to go through to just get enrolled and achieve a PhD, that's our, that's our legacy. So if we're two generations deep in education, and you rarely come across the first, the first biochemistry degree at a particular university. We're doing incredible things, but a narrative is broken. Is broken. The, the second thing I wanted to share is that we've got to change the use of our technology. As his brother is saying, is we might have a white teacher in the room trying to connect to the students, but that does not mean the technology needs to reflect the culture that teachers should reflect the culture of the students. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, African-centered education is about allowing students to understand how the content speaks to their lives and can impact the change of the community. And it's, it's facts. It is documented. It is. It is well-researched. Facts. So, uh, it's, it's up to, to people like you to really change the narrative. So simple message, as we have this Sankofa education, as we look forward and make sure we re reflect what's back behind us, is uh, there's incredible opportunities, and I thank you for your time, and welcome to Stanford University. Please restate your name. My name is Brian Brown, I'm Associate Professor of Science Education and the Associate Dean of Student Affairs here at the Graduate School of Education. Thank you. How many of us are familiar with the celebration of Kwanzaa? Excellent. Um, it's a traditional African Aboriginal um, conglomeration, I would say. He, uh, Dr. Milana Karanga said he took the best of African principles and put them all together. How many are familiar with the Uthinguza Saba or the seven principles celebrated in Kwanzaa? So write that down, put that in your notes, the Nguza Saba. And the importance for this, for today specifically, is that we bring this into the classroom in a way that is fitting to the culture of the students, all right? And so we want our learning community, right? Uh, as a scholar said, this scholar uh, in, in business, he said that there's no more neighborhoods in the black community, community. There's no more neighbors, we only got hoods, right? So we want to bring a learning community into our classroom, and we can do so using these principles in a very um, significant unity to strive for and maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race. Self-determination, to define ourselves, name ourselves, create ourselves, and speak for ourselves. My grandmother, who's not in her 90s, she said that she's been colored, she's been black, she's been African-American, she's been a Negro, and she's been a nigger. <laughs> right? And if you surprisingly looking at me, she's also been white. <laughs> she's pretty fair-skinned. She said when she went out of town, she was white, right? Self-determination, so we have to be able to name ourselves. Collective work and responsibility. This is what's called the opposite of the American education system. That talks about how good I can do, how well I will become, as opposed to we. Collective work and 
responsibility to build and maintain our community together and make our brothers and sisters problems our problems and to solve them together. Cooperative economics, to build and maintain our own stores, shops, and other businesses and to profit from them together. Purpose, NIA, to make our collective vocation the building and developing of our community in order to restore our people to their traditional greatness. Traditional greatness. Let me say that again. Traditional. How many of you heard of New England Patriots? <laughs> they got a lot of rings. You can like them or dislike them, whatever. How many of you have heard of the Boston Celtics? A lot of rings out there in, in, in Boston Celtics. How many heard of the, the Lakers? A lot of rings out there, right? Asalaamu Laker. I am a Laker. Yeah. <laughs> Traditional greatness. When you look into our own history and culture, you will find traditional, this is what you have to remind your students of. Because you say, my brother said he was a second generation college, right? And if, uh, if there was a, a circumstance, he might have been a first generation. But we have to relate our tradition. We, we come from the first kings and queens, architects, doctors, yeah. lawyers, yeah. navigators, all of the above. We were the first. Creativity to do all, always as much as we can in the way that we can in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited. I'm ashamed to say that I, I, I went through college and I barely used that word ever, creativity. I, I, it wasn't taught to me, creativity. A college graduate. My fourth year at Arizona State University, I had a class on creativity. They made me, they forced me to be bored and to see if I would endure. Right? Until I could learn to be creative like my ancestors. Imani, faith, to believe with all our heart in our people. That's kind of contrary to everything that we just learned, right? Because in words are not people who make a difference, right? That's, that's what's being taught. To believe in all our heart in our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. So I hope that you'll incorporate that into your classroom. Look that up because it's a, it's a great opportunity. It's really something for you to work from. Put your pens and papers out. RJ in Ohio is our website. That's Racial Justice Now is our organization. RJNOhio.org. And this is our uh, in backslash CRCTK. That's Culturally Relevant Curriculum Toolkit. Culturally Relevant Curriculum Toolkit, CRCTK. And so we're at the website here. I'm going, how many, we, we like to talk about cultural reference, and I got that from Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings. That's another name, if you're not familiar, Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, a theoretician around culturally relevant teaching and culturally, culturally relevant practices. She talks about, here's, here's a good word for you, cultural reference. Cultural reference. So I'm going to show you a cultural reference. How many of us remember cassette tapes? Cassette tape had a boom box, had a, a player. Oh, y'all, some of y'all, 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 this boy, y'all. Y'all remember cassettes? Do you remember when the cassette would mess up? All the stuff come out and then you tie it back up, right? Okay, so now we're talking about a cultural reference. So you're there with me, right? You're there, you can see it. So you, when you put the cassette in, you will push. And if you wanted to hear your song again, you will press. And if you want to go a little bit forward, you will press. And if your mama knocked on the door, you were pressed. Oh, hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. You don't want to hear that. So what we're going to do right now, we're going to fast forward to the Culture Development Curriculum Toolkit as we come up on our time. There's some great stuff in here. And we're going to go down to the 12-point plan to push school districts forward. That's something you want to uh, really look on and draw from. It's a great document, uh, our 12-point plan to move our school districts forward. Implement reading in schools, uh, miseducation of Negro up from slavery. Implement a three-year district-wide initiative teaching the game of chess and its history. Where did chess come from? Dark-skinned people. Implement culturally relevant books and course supplements in the course of study. As we know that there are only five major publishers of textbooks across the nation. So we need some supplements of those textbooks to assist you in your classroom work. Implicit bias training in the context of oppression, that's Baba Wakesa can help you out in the back with that. You're going to hear from him a little <laughs> later. Incorporate local black Daytonians into your curriculum or local Californians 
that are black into your curriculum. Use the Oregon Baseline Essays and Professional <laughs> Development for teachers. How many are you familiar with the Oregon Baseline Essay? Portland. Portland Baseline Essay. Portland Baseline. You break that down, please. Please write it down twice. Portland Baseline Essays. Winding down. Portland. It's Portland, Portland. yeah. Baseline essay. It's on the back. You, you all have a copy of this. Yeah. That he's reading from. You have a copy of it. It's both sides. So he's, it's in there. All of this is on there. You have to know that. Many of you have found problems. Your principals, administrators have found problems in your schools involving black children and black families. So I'm saying look to black scholars. Right. Such as Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu, Dr. Gloria Ladson Billy, Billy, Dr. Asa Hill, Dr. Malethi Asante, Dr. John Henry Clark, and others that you will find in the toolkit. Look to them for your answers. Implement a district-wide academic Olympics with events such as debate team chess and robotics. We are a competitive people. We like to get them W's. We like to win. Pop said, I ain't mad at you. Bring restorative justice and peace circles into the school culture. Using storytellers to build the joy of learning in accord with the griot tradition. How many of you have heard that term griot? G-R-O-T. Write it down twice, please, on your paperwork. Griot is a storyteller. Yes, indeed. Address varied learning styles of students. Many students are audio learners. Many are tactile learners. Many are visual learners. We have to engage all of the <laughs> learning styles of your students. Many students are associative learners, so they want to be able to associate the opposite of seeing white faces on all the documents in your book, right? They want to be able to associate with the curriculum. They also want to be able to associate with the teacher, right? How many of you are familiar with a thing called hip-hop music? I'm getting close on my time. I'm winding down, winding down. <laughs> hip-hop music, you should, get, you, you should ask your children about hip-hop music. You should ask them their favorite artists and why on a regular basis. You gotta stay up with pop culture. Powerful. So I started off with a story. I'm in with a story. We're gonna close out very quickly. A uh, young lady born in Maryland um, during the time of slavery, black woman named Francesca. He called her Franny. She was born a free woman. She was like the movie 12 Years a Slave. She was kidnapped, taken to West Virginia, hit over the head, <coughs> taken to West Virginia, took her shoes, put her into slavery. Because she's a strong black woman, because she was courageous and bold, she tried to escape, although she had children, she tried to escape. They brought her back, they caught her. Her punishment was that some of her children had to be sold off further down south. This is in West Virginia. She was never scared like Bone Crusher. You don't know who that is? Go ahead and look it up. Yeah. Hip-hop music. She was never scared, so she tried again. This time she was successful with her children. One of her children was named... John Jameson Moore. John Jameson Moore grew up to be the first bishop of the AME Zion Church. John Jameson Moore founded the first church in San Francisco after the AM, in the AME Zion denomination, the first church west of the Mississippi. It was tied to Frederick Douglass. If you don't know who that is, you should. Tied to That church is tied to Harriet Tubman. That church is tied to abolitionists like Sojourner Truth. It was called, and is called, the Freedom Church. John Jameson Moore, the son, one of the sons of Franny, became a bishop there. John Jameson Moore had a son named Henry Harrison Moore. That son became a, a minister as well. Somehow got caught back up in slavery because his wife, Amanda Lucinda DeVault, was on a plantation, was hit over the head, and had a, a deathbed wish for her son, Isaiah Henry Harrison Moore. That deathbed wish was for that child to become a minister. That child decided that he would go through hell to fulfill his mother's deathbed wish. Isaiah Henry Harrison Moore became a traveling minister in Kentucky, and he also became a dean of college of the Bible of Scriptures, a dean there. Isaiah Henry Harrison Moore had 12 children, eight girls, four boys, all four of the boys died. One of those girls was named Thelma Moore who later moved to Ohio from Kentucky where her father was. Thel Thelma Moore married Clarence Hercules Foster. They had two sons, Michael Foster and Irvin Foster. Irvin Foster had two sons, 
One is a professor at the University of Texas today, and the other son is me. And so when you know more, you can do more. Coach, development curriculum. Thank you for your time.